so much that us early career researchers can do and that people will listen to us. Okay. Um. So our next talk, very excitingly, is going to come online. Um, Mr. Colin Wilkinson is a co-chair of Versus Arthritis Fellowship Experts Committee um, and involved in writing their research roadmap for pain, which led to the advanced pain discovery platform being established. Colin is chair of the network um, of public contributors involved in the consortium to research individual, interpersonal and social influences of pain. Um, Colin was also a member of the NICE Guideline Committee for Chronic Pain and has been a part of four other NICE guidelines. His career as a science communicator mainly working in schools, um, but this came to an end following a clinical negligence incident in 2018, since when he's focused on being a public contributor to health research and policy. And Colin has lived with chronic pain since the age of 18, so almost 30 years, and I can see that he's online, so hopefully this will all magically work. Over to Colin. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to get my talk up. So I've chosen as my title uh, for this talk something that came from a typed yellow sheet that my father gave me. It was some principles that ICI would use in negotiating with trade unions. And the title, given that it was written in the 1970s, was Start Where the Other Man Is, because all of the trade union of officials and all of the personnel managers were men. It was part of a training course that was designed to help those personnel managers negotiate successfully with trade unions and success in those negotiations was reaching a resolution of the dispute which allowed everyone to go away feeling fairly treated. That starting where the other person is is also a basic principle of visitor studies and event management. If you don't think about your event or your venue from the visitor's point of view, then you can't possibly expect them to have, then you can't possibly understand their experience. If you get your signage wrong or you make it unclear how people access your venue or you put the toilets in the wrong place, those people will start their day grumpy and invariably end up at least as grumpy as they started. And I say this having organised more events than I care to remember and made more mistakes in doing so than I shall ever admit. And I've been a visitor more times than I care to remember as well. On one occasion, I actually became the visitor attraction by being hauled up some stairs on the platform list. And as you might imagine, some choice gestures that I made ruined some visitors' attempts at photographing my humiliating progress. Looking at a situation from where someone else starts seems an important tenet of involvement in research and of trustworthy research to me. Health research that doesn't start by understanding the problems it's trying to address from the viewpoint of the people who live with those problems is unlikely to solve the problems that matter to those people. And whatever anybody says, I don't believe there are stock outcomes that matter to people living with pain, which you can use in any research. Outcomes have to link to the research question and the other facets of the research, such as the health conditions it's investigating and the methods it's using. That means that every stage of research, from agreeing the research avenue, the question, the outcomes, the methodologies, has to involve people who live with pain. Yes, the approach to involving people in research has to be appropriate to the research, but the only way to develop an appropriate plan for involvement and an appropriate plan for the research is to involve people in developing those plans. I've looked at too many funding proposals in which involvement is used as a way to validate the research team's preconceived ideas about what they wish to do, to measure, to disseminate, and they'll often define a long list of areas where the public contributors will contribute, but very often those miss out the getting involved in the meat of the research of interpreting the findings and deciding what's really important. 
when we ensure that the people the research sets out to help agree with the way the problem is conceived, we also want the world at large to trust research and to feel that researchers have integrity. This is especially important in pain research. If we agree that chronic pain affects around one third of the population, as versus arthritis wrote in their report, uh, unseen, unequal and unfair, we can also assume that another third of the population will intimately know at least one person who lives with chronic pain. And the remaining third of the population will probably know at least two people who intimately know someone who lives with pain. In that case, everyone has a personal view about chronic pain, all eight plus billion of us. Everyone has a view on its impact, where the challenges lie and what the priorities should be. Given that fact, when we want to make the case for more, better resourced pain research and, and validate the importance and value of the research and reviews that have gone before, we need to start where the person in the street starts. My perception from sitting on a lot of local buses where I live and listening to people talk about COVID and various other things is that members of the public see researchers and clinicians as people who employ secret languages that only the initiated understand and, they, and their perception is that they do that to keep out the public and patients. Would you trust someone who asked you to join a meeting but excluded you from the discussion by conducting it in, say, hexadecimal? I want to explore what it means to trust research. In everyday life, trust is the lubricant that oils human relations. If we sign a contract with someone, we trust them to stick to its conditions. We usually trust on the basis of a selection process, understanding their past achievements, talking to others about them through references or looking at online reviews. The great thing about contracts is that there's a kind of guarantee, a long established set of ways of resolving dis disputes, whether through the courts, provisions of the contract or even alternative dispute resolution techniques. When researchers ask the public or people who live with pain to trust them or their research, it's not on the basis of experience. The person in the street has no basis, either through experience or knowledge, on which to establish whether the research or the researcher is credible or not. It would be like selecting a contractor by throwing dice. In my view, trust equates to something akin to faith. That's a, a problem when it comes to research because that trust without evidence is not where we really want people to be because that runs counter to the culture of science. In that relationship between people and science, there's also no recourse to anyone. If you, let's say, you make a decision about your care on the basis of the research, or perhaps your clinician follows a guideline that, as we heard this morning, might be based on junk research. Asking the public to trust research without recourse to remedy is like demanding blind faith. Researchers should not expect the public to have faith or trust in research. The burden of proof of reliability must rest with researchers and the standard of proof should be high. Researchers must demonstrate the value and reliability of research by adopting behaviours that allow the public to examine for and decide for themselves whether they consider an individual piece of research or the culture of research something they can rely on. There is a good reason that the loose English translation of the Royal Society's motto is take nobody's word for it. These ancient words mean something. Science doesn't rely on someone's word, it relies on evidence. If researchers want the public to engage with and rely on research and want to continue to receive public funding and enjoy public confidence, surely the onus is on researchers to do what it takes to ensure that the public 
values research and remains willing to invest it. Similarly, charitable funding for research relies on donations, which rely on people feeling they have confidence that the charity is worthwhile and that the research it funds is worthwhile. We can't ignore the impact that the opioid crisis and other health, health scandals, not least Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes, now locked up on numerous counts of fraud in the USA, have had on the public's perception of health practitioners and researchers. Knowledge of these, even if people don't really understand them, has percolated down into every tier of society. For research to answer the questions people who live with pain have, more resources will be needed. For more resources to be made available, we need the public and governments and other funders to recognise the scale of chronic pain, its costs at societal, health system and individual level, to see the urgency of the challenge and to have confidence that research has the tools to answer the key questions reliably, reproducibly and without conflicts of interest. Why should governments, people who live with pain, donors and other funders, trust or have, re or have faith that the research community can find the answers? The research community must be able to demonstrate that it can find the answers and move forward care for people living with chronic pain. That matters in every type of research, every type of methodology of research, however long the journey to healthcare impact might be. My view is that confidence relies on people being able to grasp what research is and does, how it works, and how it ensures that the effects observed are real and that the results found are real. The way science works has to seem sensible to people. It also has to be above reproach. Research cannot continue to be like a car engine in which only the person with the right computer and the right software to plug in the right socket within the car can understand how the engine works and what is going wrong with it. The longer that research, sorry, I'll just, the longer research continues to use secret languages and continues to exclude members of the public from grasping it and continues to publish behind paywalls, the longer a lack of confidence will persist. Researchers have to start where those who live with pain and those who were just now doing their Christmas shopping start to be able to solve the problems they face. The research community has to do more than public engagement and more than public involvement to ensure that the person in the street can see how research works in an everyday way. The best way to break down barriers between people who live with pain, the person in the street and researchers is to involve us, invite us in, but do it properly. Research must become an equally shared endeavour between researchers, clinicians, and people with lived experience. And that shared endeavor must also be shared with society at large. When we involve people in research, we provide the public with some sense of reassurance that this isn't a closed shop. We have to get better at empowering the people that we do involve in research to feel bold and to question everything. Too often researchers start off in their own language and have to be corrected into plain English and start off thinking to, that public contributors have to come up to their level or something approaching it. We all need to do better. Researchers need to meet public contributors on their level. They need to start where the other person starts and not expect the public contributor to start where they start. Why should I, as someone living with pain, have any confidence in research that didn't involve people living with pain? Or did the involvement in such a way that the involvement was so constrained that the involved people couldn't have a real impact on the research. Living with pain is a 
deeply personal biopsychosocial experience. Everyone's experience is different. So how on earth can researchers begin to understand it without real, full and frequent involvement of people who live with pain? That does not mean simply asking people what they think of the research question. Too many research applications that I've seen have talked about asking people whether they thought the research proposal was important. Without giving somebody an alternative, the alternative is to do no, re no research. And I've very rarely heard people who live with pain argue for less pain research. What I think is required is a more coordinated approach in which researchers, clinicians and people living with pain come together and decide to solve problems once and for all so that the public can see that a problem with pain that they will recognise is being attacked and resolved and then another problem is being selected. When I left school, I went to work in the laboratories at British Steel, in the analytical laboratories. I helped to test an ISO analytical method for iron ore using inductively coupled plasma spectrometry. Ten samples were sent to a large number of laboratories around the world. And it was a very complex protocol. And it took roughly three days to analyse one sample because we had to produce our own um, methodologies for doing it and we had to produce our own standards and then analyse each sample. I've not seen pain research validated in this way. I did have the privilege of helping to write the DICE chronic pain guideline and I'm currently helping to update the asthma and cardiovascular disease risk guidelines. Typically sample sizes in the chronic pain guideline were in the tens, in asthma the hundreds, and in cardiovascular disease risk for thousands. Why? Why is something that affects a third of the population not seeing research with large sample sizes? A, a really good first step, as far as I'm concerned, to developing a shared understanding of pain research with the public and helping them to see what trustworthy, reliable, high quality research is would be looking at whether the research was conducted with high quality public involvement and including that in assessments of research integrity. Members of the public don't really care much about citations or whether trial reviews or whether trial or review methodologies were registered in advance. There will be things that the public think are important in the way that they think about research and decide whether they think it's relevant to their experience, and that's fine. The first step to generating greater public commitment to research is something that government should fund and something that they should donate to is to understand what they value. Any set of values must be shared between the public, people with lived experience of pain, clinicians, clinician researchers, and peer researchers. Without such shared values, it will be nearly impossible to move towards a greater shared commitment to research that will give us all the opportunity to more effectively address the impact pain has on billions of lives around the world. To end on an optimistic note, the recently created shared commitment to public involvement in health research led by the HRA and the NIHR with public contributors is an outstanding example of funders researchers, leaders and public contributors coming together with remarkable ease to develop without very much disagreement at all, a real shared commitment to public involvement in research and work plans for building on shared ideals to tackle some of the seemingly intractable challenges of involvement in health research and to create consistently high quality public involvement in research everywhere. Being realistic, creating a set of standards for what reliable research looks like that is shared between everyone will be challenging. 
However, it would be far better to try and fail than to fail to try. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Colin. I don't know if you can see me, but that was absolutely brilliant. And um, we really appreciated it. Um, has anyone got any questions for Colin at this stage? I'll just check our online. There isn't any online. Has anyone thought of anything? If not, oh, yeah, great. Thanks so much for the uh, lovely talk. Uh, so I'm a statistician and I'm really bad with people. Um, so as a researcher, I'm constantly trying to work out how to, how to effectively involve uh, patients and people with lived experience uh, in research. I was wondering, are there any sort of um, case studies or great examples you could point to where you thought, yeah, they did a really great job um, and you know, any details of what they did or anything like that? It's hard to give you an example that would guide you in developing how you should involve people in your work. I think the the best advice I can give is to start early with a small group of people who have some experience and they will guide you as to how to develop the plan and also how many people you need to involve, how often, where the key points are for decisions. But basically, I would say there isn't a decision about the research that shouldn't involve people with lived experience. And there are lots of very experienced, talented public contributors out there who would be able to help you. And I'm certainly very happy to talk to you and, and see if I can help. Thank you, Colin. Um, I think we're going to have a little break.